couple months ago, I put out a tweet. Our listing agents will not be allowed to share commissions with agents. Went viral. There is no more broker to broker compensation offer advertised in the MLS under any circumstance anywhere. You know, from what I, what I've been very quite loud about and transparent about is a seller should have several options. One is, do you want to offer compensation right off the bat, like pre previous to August 17th? What's not changed, Ricky? The seller wants to know how much money they're going to walk away from after the sale of the home. You now have a new category of people who are going to say, who are going to show up at an open house and say, hey, I do not want to be represented. And so agents need to be prepared for that. It's all about education and disclosure and training and, and transparency, right? Like 50% of the buyers said, my agent worked 15 hours, it's kind of what, what I saw or what I think, right? Or how I feel. And in reality, it was on average 87 hours. Positive side is that everyone is being forced to have a compensation conversation upfront. So like there's, there's so much intricacies that we take for granted. Um, and that, that's where I get upset when I hear people, you know, suggesting that we throw out some rule sets that they're pretty not well versed in. Why does it, why does it feel like we're, we're, we're starting to go backwards? What is the best thing for the consumer? That's, I think, how you win. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Ricky Caru! Ricky Caru from Gulf Shores, Alabama. I introduce you, he's number one, not top four. He's the man of the real estate industry. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the show. Today, I've got the CEO of EXP, Leo Pereira. We get into all the hot topics. We get into the um, comp co cooperative compensation. We get into the clear cooperation policy. It's a tongue twister. And we get into should you build a team? Should you be on a team versus being a single agent? You know, what is the best in today's market? What's the business model you should be really thinking about? We get into all this stuff because a lot of people don't realize Leo was the number one Keller Williams team leader in the world at one point. He did over 4,000 thousand transactions he had a team of over 30 agents at one point this guy's been incredibly successful as a real estate agent I, I, for, now, now i heard him on a podcast say that he's the only ceo of a publicly traded company who actually sold real estate at one point which i find very interesting he went on to build remind which sold for hundreds of millions of dollars and now he's the ceo of exp and uh, just an incredible mind, um, an innovator, um, interesting uh, uh, character. And I'm happy to have him here on the show. I hope you get a lot out of this podcast. So let's get right into it. Leo, how are you, bro? I am good. Getting getting ready for EXP Con in a couple of weeks. See everybody in person. I'm excited. I know. I know, man. I'm going to be there. Um, a couple months ago, I put out a tweet after I had a conversation with you and I said, I just talked to the CEO of our brokerage, and after August 17th, our listing agents will not be allowed to share commissions with agents, Why? with agents. And uh, I had to delete it after about eight minutes because <laughs> it literally went viral, and um, you actually called me too and said, take that thing down. Um, we were... As far as EXP is concerned, what one of the we were the first right to come out publicly about getting away from cooperative compensation, and really, I think a lot of people took the te took the tweet out of I say tweet X. They took it out of context, um, you know, and they they made it they turned it into a you're not going to be able to offer it at all. They didn't realize I was talking about cooperative compensation, not in terms of like the buyer agent can't negotiate it into the deal or that the seller can't offer concessions, totally different thing, right? Completely different thing. Um, but anyway, you, you were on the forefront of, of that um, discussion in terms of the brokerages. And I think you got a lot of flack for, for it. Um, we've even had agents, brokerages around here, try to recruit away from EXP saying, don't join EXP. Um, the way that they handle the the agent exp agents are leaving in drones uh droves because you know they're not offering cooperative compensation anymore and all this stuff but it seems like everybody's starting to fall in line with 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 what you started with that whole thing um take me through the thought process man when you as this thing was unfolding 
and you decided what was the moment that you realized that we weren't going to have cooperative compensation anymore yeah no that, that so re reliving that and, and i appreciate you taking it down because that that made my phone blow up quite a bit so uh so let, let's kind of rewind the movie and all the way to the beginning right so last october uh there was a a, a lawsuit lost right and that was the catastrophic kind of pivoting point where it's like uh oh the world is different and then March 15th of this 2024, um, NAR settled for $418 million and put out a 190 page document with all the new rules. And, you know, I spent two days unpacking that. And paragraph 19 was very specific. There is no more broker to broker compensation offer advertised in the MLS under any circumstance anywhere. And then that, that rule was very specific where it was like, there is no broker to broker commission sharing advertisement period. Um, paragraph 32, if you scroll all the way down, allows for it off the MLS, as long as there's no IDX involved and there's two clicks separation and everything else. When we looked at that, and then you couple that with the DOJ sending a cease and desist to California Association of Realtors when they created broker to broker forms, which then they quickly took down like seven days later and no longer create any of them in the state of California. We said, okay, we operate in 50 states. We don't have the, the luxury of saying, hey, we're just kind of going to do it this way because each market is kind of taking a different approach. And so we said, what is the best way to ensure that we feel that we are following the, not only the settlement, but the spirit of our interpretation of what's eventually going to happen in probably the most of the country, but still empowering our agents to be able to serve customers buyers and sellers the best way possible, because that's the only thing that really matters at the end of the day, right? And so our agents can take a listing with a listing fee paid by the seller to the listing agent. And at that point, you know, what we're training is that agents should fully expect all to explain all of the possible different ways that a buyer agent is compensated, whether that is a seller to broker com compensation offered at the time of listing. So you at eXp can take a listing and the seller can offer compensation directly to the buyer broker. You can advertise it off the MLS, just like the other companies do with broker to broker. But we're just saying it needs to be a separate document with a separate conversation. And the seller has to be in the driver's seat of that decision. So, mm -hmm. you know, from what I, what I've been very quite loud about and transparent about is a seller should have several options. One is, do you want to offer compensation right off the bat, like pre previous to August 17th? Well, for us, instead of broker to brokers through seller to broker, where the seller's in the driver's seat, the seller has the option to say, I'm not disclosing the amount. I'm completely negotiable. Put it in the offer. Or the seller can choose to say, no comment, basically, right? And again, this is not just me. This is across the country, the different flavors of ice cream that we're seeing. And then the buyer can instruct the buyer's agent to put it in the contract, right? Mm -hmm. And so... What we're seeing is since we came out and said that, the Austin Board of Realtors came out and they don't have broker to broker forms. Kansas City, St. Louis, MLS is in Missouri where the case was tried, don't have them. Um, we're seeing more and more states say, maybe we should rethink how we do this. And then you're seeing more and more states do different things with purchase and sale contracts. So my favorite purchase and sale contract I've seen is in Northern Virginia, the Northern Virginia Association of Realtors. Page one has the price, the financing, you know, all the stuff that you're used to seeing, but right below the price and financing, they now have seller to buyer contribution for concessions and closing costs. And right below it, there's another line that says seller to buyer brokerage compensation. And it spells out, this is a binding agreement between the seller and the buyer brokerage that may, must be amended in writing, right? So if you think about it from a net sheet standpoint, what's not changed, Ricky, after August 17th is, the seller wants to know how much money they're going to walk away from after the sale of the home. And the buyer needs to know how much money they need to bring to the settlement table to afford this new home with their monthly payment. Mm -hmm. Those two things haven't changed one bit. The conversation, the disclosure, and that's what's really changed. Because at the end of the day, the buyer is going to buy what they can afford and the seller is going to sell what they can afford to sell it for. And mm -hmm. so as agents, it's our job to make sure that we guide them in the best fiduciary responsibility. But I do believe it is the agent's fiduciary responsibility to explain all of this, to give them options, right? In a high inventory market, uh, I, I fully expect to see sellers offer more compensation. In a low inventory market, I fully expect agents or sellers to offer less compensation. Because by the way, that's what happened before August 17th. Right. If you look at new homes, which you're really familiar with, right, when there was a line out the door, 
builders may have offered less or a flat fee. And then when there is six months of inventory, 12 months, 18 months of inventory, we see on closeout sales, they're offering substantially more. So yeah. there's variability in the market. The, the one thought that I've been articulating quite a bit is on the seller side of the house, I've been licensed 23 years, you've been licensed almost as long. There was always different populations we worked with, right? There was five to 10% of sellers that are for sale by owners. And they chose not to work with anybody. And in the entire time you've been licensed, Ricky, you you worked with for sale by owners on the buy side and you made sure that they signed something saying you'd be compensated, correct? Mm, right. Like right. that hasn't changed. Right. There, there are listing firms that for decades have done it for a flat fee. Mm. There are yeah. listing firms that do it for a menu of services, meaning I'll do X for mm -hmm. this, I'll do Y for that, I'll do Z for that. And mm -hmm. outside of that, you know, it's a la carte. And then there's a yeah. whole bunch of companies that do it for percentages ranging from this to this, right? There's all in between in variability. What is true is prior to the settlement, the buy set had no variability. It was what was offered in the MLS, right? So I do fully expect and I'm seeing variability where... You know, there's buyer agents and, and brokerages who can roll out products, flat fee, just, and, and when sometimes I say this, it's like, what do you see changing? I say, copy paste what we see on the seller side to come to the buy side. So mm -hmm. I fully expect to see a whole bunch of buyers uh, equal to the seller percentages that choose to be unrepresented. And, 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 and for simplicity, I call them FISBO buyers, right? Mm -hmm. There are going to be people who read CNN and Reddit and everything else and decide just like some sellers do. We're like, you know what? I can do this myself. Mm -hmm. And so agents need to be prepared for that on, on two sides. One on the buy side where there's going to be folks that don't want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And on the listing side, you now have a new category of people who are going to say, who are going to show up at an open house and say, Hey, I do not want to be represented. And I want to buy this house. And so you need to have that conversation with the seller ahead of time where you know, what I teach is say, hey, look, before August 17th, this is the way the world worked. After August 17th, this is the way the world works. So look, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, this is the fee you owe me for the services I render to you. But let's have a conversation right now before we list the house of what happens in the case that somebody walks in at an open house and is choosing to stay unrepresented. They want to be unrepresented. Mm -hmm. That is a different service in value proposition you're asking for me with additional liability and additional services. And there's mm -hmm. a separate fee for that, right? Yeah. And again, it's it's all about education and disclosure and training and, and transparency, right? Like that's why we chose to write our own agreements and say, hey, this is the fee I'm charging you as a seller, to, as your as to to represent you as a seller. If someone walks in unrepresented, this is the fee that you need to pay me to render additional services. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, the most likely scenario is that a buyer is going to walk in with a um um and with with the um the with a buyer and we will have to um now negotiate offer what, whatever you choose to do mr or mrs seller right because it's it's the seller's choice what they want to do mm. yeah so I'll, I'll pause right there i kind of went on a rant well, well what what i think what i find fascinating is that um there was a study done i think there's a company called rain uh r a y n e are you familiar mm, I, I know of an mls right. name rain but i'm not familiar with a company so they they um they basically it's it's a data company for sure uh i'm, I'm not familiar with every single little thing they do but they did this survey where they took a bunch of buyers and they surveyed them and they basically was asked asked them a lot of things about um the you know the transaction and everything else and 50 percent of those buyers stated that um that they that they thought that their agent worked 15 hours on the transaction and see oh what this what this company does basically it's in an app it's an app and what happens is is it tracks you as the as the agent it tracks all of your hours and your work oh, right, and your right, right. so it's it's spelled r-a-y-s-e okay race. okay that, that, that's exactly race, race, right not rain race yeah and so yep. uh, are so you're familiar with that? Very familiar. Okay, yeah, yeah. So so it is so cool when you dig into the data behind that. Um, because fifty percent of the buyers said my agent worked 15 hours, kind of what what I saw or what I think, right? Or how I feel. And in reality, it was on average 87 hours. 
that the buyer agent worked across like 130 different tasks. And uh, like if a buyer wants to go buy, buy owner, right? And be their own agent, represent themselves. They don't want to hire me to be their agent. I'm almost like, knock yourself out. You just gave me 87 hours back of my life <laughs> that I can go spend on something else, another client, enjoying whatever I do. And if you got 87 or 90 hours, let's call it, if you got 90 hours where you want to deal with the headache and deal with all the stuff that goes behind. And by the way, you're not a professional, so you're not going to be able to get the job done in 90 hours like me because I am a professional. And by the way, I'm not trying to say all this to get, to get them to change their mind. I actually really uh, want the general public to go out and experience trying to sell properties by owner, trying to buy properties by owner, because there's a big misconception about the value that agents bring. And what better way than to let them go through these situations on their own to, to help them uh, have a have a come to light uh, situation, yeah. but so, enlightened about what we actually do as, as an industry. Um, so I've, I've been I've been quite loud from the beginning that I, I completely disagree with the premise of the litigation, and I don't think we did anything wrong as a, as an industry. We we were just working within the framework that existed, right? So, um, you know, in no way do I agree with what happened. Now, when when something like this happens, I do try to find the silver lining, and the one thing that I think the settlement has brought forth is that it's a forced conversation about what we actually do, how do we earn it, when do we earn it, how do we get paid. So, you know, again. Very clearly, I, I, I was not an advocate for this. I'm still quite bitter about it. <laughs> I, I don't hide it. Um, but but the, the positive side is that everyone is being forced to have a compensation conversation up front, right? This is, this is what has changed, Ricky. Assume every buyer presentation is now competitive. It, every buyer's agent is now a listing agent for, for a frame of reference, right? When you looked historically, it was mostly like 60% of agents stayed in the buy side and never actually creeped over to be listing agents. And again, I, I have the numbers at scale. Um, and I think it was mostly because it avoided that confrontational conversation of you're going to pay me X for Y, right? Prior to the settlement changes with the offer of compensation in the MLS, it was kind it was somewhat like, hey, don't worry about it. I'm I'm being taken care of. You don't need to part with any money. Right. That's what a lot of buyers agents either verbally said or insinuated with their behavior. Right. It was like, this is what would happen. I'd bump into you at an open house somewhere socially. I wanted to see a house. Don't worry about it. I'll be there at two o'clock. I'll lock the door. And if there was chemistry before you knew it, I was your agent. But there was I can tell you and you know this that as a rule, it wasn't like meet me at the office at two o'clock for a buyer presentation. I need both of you there. And, and we're going to do we're going to go through like 14 slides and then I'm going to present a, a, an agreement and it's going to discuss what you're paying me and when. That's not what right. used to happen. Yeah, that is now what is happening. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things that I'm I am happy about is that I think it's going to level up our profession. The people who take this seriously, the people who are skills based and value based and professional based are going to be able to articulate what it is they do, how they do it. And I think it's it's going to create a higher level of professionalism, right? Because the folks who were kind of hoping to bump into somebody and then were taking whatever was being offered didn't have to have that level of skill, right? You you So if every buyer presentation is now a listing presentation to follow on along with my analogy, you better have a presentation. It better articulate what you do and what you get paid for it. These are the services I'll, I'll, I'll render, and this is the money I'll accept for their services. And again, it could be flat fee, their menu of services or percentage based. That's your business decision. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have a real compensation conversation up front yeah. where I'm going to explain to you exactly on average how long it takes me to do it and what I do it for and what yeah. I'm willing to do and not willing to do, right? And that's what happened on the listing side. So that is now going to come to the buy side at scale. And, and, and to your point, I look, I respect consumers if they want to do it themselves, but let's just look at FISBO data. If this is the percentage of people that attempt FISBO, statistically speaking, you know this, it's like this many actually go through with it. 70 to 80% of people in the last 10 years who've started the FISBO process at some point tap out hire a professional because they realize it's a full-time job. So to your exact point with the raised analogy and the technology, um, 
that's exactly what I think is going to happen. I think there's going to be a portion. There's going to be a portion of buyers who are going to say, "I'm going to go at it alone," and then after the second, third, fourth week, getting outbid, having trouble scheduling showings because they have a full time job and they're not available to to be on phone calls and texts and and scheduling, and they don't have access to the technology with showing time and the lock boxes and everything else. I think a large portion of the folks who are going to attempt it are going to come to a decision point and say, I want to hire a professional, yeah. which again is, is, is what we see on the seller side. So this is not me being demeaning or anything about consumers. It's just, it's a full-time job. Well, it's like roofing your house. You just, you might climb on the ladder and, and look, look down. But you're but not, you're gonna... there, there is a portion of the human population who can actually watch a YouTube video and are very handy and can do it. My brother-in-law is one of those people. My, my brother-in-law finished his entire basement. He's an engineer by trade. He's super, super intelligent. He's really good at with his hands. And he did the electrical, the plumbing, and he did it. He pulled permits and it turned out beautiful. I would have yeah. burnt my house down, right? I, I'm not that guy, but I think a small percentage of humans can like yeah. decide to do stuff like that. Right. Um, but I do believe that the, the the risk and the dollars involved in what we do, I think a very large portion of the population is going to still choose to have proper representation. Hmm. I'm seeing it with for sale by owners like crazy right now. I'll, I'll um, call for sale by owners and every single for sale by owner is listed already. And they just listed like a week ago or three days ago or 13 days ago. And they're already listed. They've already thrown the towel in. Uh, well, and, 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 and I'll tell you, statistically speaking, FISBOs are always part of the population. The lowest years I've seen is about 5%. The highest mm. have been like 12, 13%. Mm. And if you put it on a chart, it literally has to do with level of inventory, right? Mm. In 2009, mm. 2010, we had the lowest amount of FISBOs ever because you, like I lived in DC, Maryland, Virginia areas where I sold real estate you can throw a rock and not hit a for sale by owners or, or a for sale sign, right? Like if you had any chance at selling a property, you had to list it with an agent because you wanted as much exposure as possible. Right. Yeah. Versus if you're listing a house and you get 26 offers and it escalates by a hundred grand, that's when you have the highest percentage of his. And again, I'm, I'm not being, I'm not telling you my opinion. I'm telling you statistically what happens, right? right? If right. there's one month of inventory, two weeks of inventory, that is when for sale by owners are, tend to be the most successful. And so mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's always there. It's always a small percentage of the market, but obviously depending on inventory, it tends to be a lot lower if there's a lot of inventory. Isn't it a weird time in the market where, you know, you said earlier, like when inventory is lower, um, you know, the sellers are, 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 are less inclined to pay the buyer agent fees and less inclined to do things because inventory is lower, right? When inventory is higher, it's like, you know, yeah, come on, we'll we'll pay anybody a buyer agent fee and stuff like that. But that, it's kind of a weird market right now because inventory is low historically, right? But yeah, we we have, we're, we're down to two thousand eight or below. I think we'll be below two thousand eight uh, when it comes to number of transactions this year. Um, we're kind of in a weird. Yeah, like, but, no but sometimes sometimes I like to remember and uh, remind people to just think about the greater economy, right? Whether it's cars. And you know they they have trouble moving them. They're doing the zero percent financing, or they give massive incentives to where they're charging a premium on new car, right? Like, I, I think sometimes we get too myopic in real estate and just say, hey, in in supply and demand of any product or service, there's a lot of demand. There's 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 different terms, and so um, again, whether we we generically say sellers, like look at home builders, look at institutional buyers and sellers of real estate, they will use incentives depending on supply and demand and the behavior they're trying to, to, to accomplish. So, you know, the one thing that was not said enough during the trial that I firmly believe is that the buyer compensation, the cooperative compensation offered was actually demand gen lead marketing dollars, right? Think about it. We when we would market a property, and we offer compensation. No, no different than builders do today, or, or 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 sellers can do right now through in our company, seller to broker compensation, is we're actually asking someone to spend a lot of their time and resources, gas, insurance, uh, you know, having lunch with these people, two, three, four, six months of their life, right, mm -hmm. for the promise that they will get paid. 80, at the end. Eighty-seven hours. Eighty-seven yep. hours on average. So, so we're, we're saying, Hey, we're offering, like, this is not a, a thing we do just for fun. It's like, Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Professional, I want you to spend, according to that statistic, two and a half weeks full time. Obviously it's spread out over months typically with this person. 
and only to be paid if a transaction is consummated. So I, I think buyer compensation throughout the entire trial was not presented the way it really was, which is demand gen lead. And right. And for anybody who who argues about like, well, other countries, the fees are low. Where first of all, if you look at the G7, I think we're the second lowest, right? And if you look at scale in most other countries, the fees are, are similar to ours or higher. But what I can tell you, it is wildly more inefficient because there's no cooperative, even data sharing. And um, you know, we can touch on CCP. I wrote a uh, an op-ed about it earlier uh, in the week, where you know, it's it's the North American system is efficient. It's accurate, right? The f we take for granted that we can pull comps, and 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 you can do a radius search around your neighborhood. In other countries, you're like, I have no clue, because there's 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 no public record that's available. There's no unified central database. Um, like we have one of the most efficient markets on the planet, and you know that's why I'm such a fierce protector of it. Yeah, I've been to Brazil. I went down there. Um, you know, I, I was stunned. When they were like, we don't have MLS. I was like, what, where, where, what, is, what is MLS? I was like, okay. And then I started digging in. It's like, they don't even have county records. They don't have like tax records and stuff. Um, they have no clue. Like the only people that have comps are the agents that actually sold the properties. And then they hoard that information um, to, to, to use it for their own, you know, uh, their own business, you know, to, to use those comps to, you know, they don't even share that information with the other agents. It's, it's wild um similar kind of thing in south africa and, and so forth so you know you're right when you really stretch out beyond the u.s and you start to realize how good we actually got it and it's and, crazy and north america because the canadian system is identical to ours so i i just refer to as north american way um but right, right. you leave these two countries and it is it we're the envy of the rest of the world like you know, my previous life, I built and sold a, a, a technology for MLSs, and I would get calls from Japan and Australia and like people in the government who are like, how do we bring this here? Because it's so much more efficient, right? The one part of that um, efficiency that I think is overlooked is liquidity, right? Like you, you, you do a lot of invest in stuff. There is a price in every one of these 50 states that you can list a property on a Friday and you can apply the appropriate discount based on inventory. Right, follow along. Appropriate price discount. If you have eighteen months of inventory, it might be twenty percent. But if you have one week of inventory, it could be market or like five percent. Right, and you could receive twenty, thirty offers over the weekend, and you can pick the cash, no concession, no no contingency closes in ten days. The fact that we can turn real estate into cash in like less than thirty days in this country, yeah. and it's normal, yeah. and it can happen anywhere. Right. Yeah. It's unfathomable in the rest of the country, or the rest of the world, Ricky. We just sold yeah, my parents' yeah. house in Belize. My parents uh, went down there after my, my my brother and I moved out of the house. And now I'm married. We have kids and they want to be near the grandkids in Florida. And it took me four years, Ricky, to sell one piece of real estate, right? Because over mm -hmm. there, I had to hire... First of all, I ended up switching out the broker four or five times because it took forever and no one would even generate a single showing. But in other countries where you don't have this organiz organizational database that is the MLS, you have to hope that the right keystrokes get put into Google and the right mm. individual WordPress website that some agent built on some form builder. And then the right yeah. consumer wants to see the house and the buyer and the listing agent has to do both sides of the transaction because there is forget cooperative compensation or seller to broker like we talk about. Like it just doesn't exist. Like you take a house, you find the buyer yourself, right? And so right. Um, I would say it's it's a complete database. It's accurate and and it's liquid. And 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 again, I, I this is a subject I can rant about. So you you're kind of hitting on my hot points here, Ricky. But accurate, like we take for granted the fact that you and I agree on the definition of a word. Bedroom. Bedroom is actually a closet, a window. 60 foot egress with 44 inches from the windowsill and a door. Mm. You can, in other countries, there's no rules. You could say it's a three, two and you get there and it's a, it's a two, one with a, with a, with no a windowless room. That's five by five. Right. Yeah. When we yeah. say active, that is a definition that it's available, that you can show it within reasonable time. And if, and if the listing agent won't show it, you can hit a button and report them to the MLS and the listing gets pulled. Right. Mm. 
in, in, in depending on the part of the country, there's a total square footage includes above grade or below grade. In other parts, it does not. And that local market decides what the rules are. So like there's, there's so much intricacies that we take for granted. Um, and that, that's where I get upset when I hear people, you know, suggesting that we throw out some rule sets that they're pretty not well versed in. Well, that, that, that exactly. It, 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 like, it seems like we're leading the world when it comes to like the innovation of the real estate industry and, you know, um, liquidating properties in 30 days, et cetera, et cetera, which by the way, do they not? Do they put a sign up on that house in Belize? Like, do you have any no, drive bys? We, 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 we had all that stuff, but like again. So, for example, we operate in twenty four countries as ZXP. Your French counterparts in the south of France. I, I was in Nice over the summer doing a mastermind, and an agent said, "Leo, to get a total picture of the available inventory in the south of France, you have to go to eight to ten portals." There, there is the there's the Zillow of France that's like the number one. But then there is like number two, number three, number four. And unless the agent lists them all of them and you want to make sure you're not missing any, you have to go to like eight to ten different places, right? Like we as Americans and Canadians take that for granted because we just even if you go to Zillow Homes, Realtor, fill in the blank, National Port, or even expealty.com, we have national feeds that populate everything. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter almost whether you're on kw.com, compass, K, uh, like any of them, you still have a total view of the inventory. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have to go to brokerage to brokerage website to see all the houses and piece it together and export it into Excel. Right? right. And that's what happens in countries where you don't have this efficient marketplace like we have. Well, that's what I was, that's what I was getting at. Why does it feel like, us being the leader of the world, that why does it why does it feel like we're 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 starting to go backwards? Well, right? I mean, I, I, I think that if you're if you're where you're going with that is like there is I think two very clear camps on CCP right now. So clear cooperation policy is it's not the, just CCP, right? It's this whole settlement thing with with basically going back to the way the commissions were forty years ago when there were a lot of lawsuits and buyers were unrepresented. That's why we went to this in the first place. Now we're going back. Now you got this argument with CCP and which keeps everything together. And the reason why we're the most envied uh market uh in the world and everybody would just, you know, give up everything to have a, a system like we have. It just seems like it seems like we're yes, you know, so like we're moving in reverse. What, what I think happened was like the, the litigation and created a lot of chaos into the system, right? So there, there is big dollars involved. There is people who are, have very strong opinions, myself included. Um, and, and I think in this moment, anytime there's a lot of change and chaos, there's, there's typically big, big feelings and, and big opinions around what should or should not happen. Right. And so again, I've, I've been very loud and vocal though of where, where we think uh, we should be. And, and again, it's, it's, it's not about Leo's opinion. It's about what is the best thing for the consumer? I'm my, my number one decision tree is what is the most transparent, fair way to treat buyers and sellers. And if that continues to be our North star as agents, that's, I think how you win because forget settlements, forget CCP, all that stuff is inside baseball to real estate. If you talk to a young family who is awaiting their first child and their lease is up in 60 days, they don't care about broker to broker. They don't care about CCP. They don't care about BBAs. Like this is all gibberish to them. They say, Hey, I need to get into a home that I can afford to raise my family and do what I need to do next. And so I think an agent's role right now is to be well-versed in the do's and don'ts be able to clearly articulate what the options to the consumer are and guide them through the process. And again, I, I've done a ton of media recently. And one of the things I'm very clear about is I, I keep saying right now, we're going to experience a messy middle. And that's where I think we're in right now, right? Where some states are doing it one way, other states are doing it another way. An MLS in the same state is disagreeing with the other MLS. Yeah. Um, there, there was a state where the DRE, the, 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 the Department of Real Estate, issuing the licenses was publicly disagreeing with the, the state association that wrote the forms, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're in this transition period. Yeah. I promise to everyone will come to an end at one point and we will be in what a new normal is. Mm -hmm. What, when and what, 
that time yeah. will show it. But yeah. It, you know, the analogy I keep making, it's like at some point this will be as ridiculous as when we were wiping down our groceries during COVID mm -hmm. because we will now just have a new way of doing things. It, and the new way could be there's three or four flavors of ice cream. You can do it this way, this way or this way. Or um, but, you know, before we had one way, now there's two or three or four acceptable practices in that market. Because, um, again, if, if we look at the listing side and compare it to what seller representation has looked like for you know the two decades I've been in the business or you've been in the business. Um, there is there's some kind of ways that 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 agents interact with consumers. I totally agree. Like whatever the new rules are, show them to me and I'll go crush it. Like I'll go help people buy and sell real estate. That part that part's a done deal. What bothers me, and it doesn't matter, but but the part that bothers me is that I feel like we've We've got these um, highly ulterior motived uh, pushes towards reversing what we've spent all this time to build. And in the scenario you just said with the family that needs to find a house because their lease is going to be up and they got to be somewhere. They don't care about all the gibberish. However, we, we don't even know about this home that they would love. That's 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 actually the best deal for them because of some weird changes to CCP, right? And everybody's not on the same playing field and the buyer and now, and I think we're getting into like some fair housing stuff and some discriminatory type things. And I just, I'm just like looking at this and I see the big guys that are saying no CCP. And I'm just thinking, well, give me, give me one good reason outside of a celebrity might want, might not want their home on MLS, right? How is this going to be the best for Susie and, 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 and Donald, who are about to get kicked out of their home, who, who have saved up for four years to buy a home, but they can't find what they want because it's on your platform and not the one that they happen to know about. So, that's so again, what, I, what yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you and I've been quite vocal about it. So I, I wrote an op-ed that was published recently in Inman about it. And, and I articulated everything you're saying. I, I think that look let's let's unpack what an mls is it's 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 a database which is what people assume it is but it's also a set of rules and they bring a participation rule with it right and that's the the, the basis of of ccp of if you sign a listing and you're publicly marketed and it's got to be in the mls within 24 hours um in order to have access to this database this cooperative database if you want to take you must give under the same rules right where where i have a problem is if a company say hey I don't have to stick it in the MLS. I can put it on my own private website. And if and when it sells, like I'll never have to put it in. And guess what? If I don't get the activity I want on in 30, 60 days, then I'll put it in the MLS. That's not how cooperatives work, right? The reason we all participate and share everything is because we have the promise of an equal reciprocatory response of you sharing yours with us. And so and by definition, if a group of people control a, a set of properties that other groups of people don't have access to, by definition, you're going to create scenarios that are not good. Mm -hmm. Full stop, period. End of the conversation, right? And, right. And, and whether it's malicious or not, it's the fact that it's not accessible easily, right? And and when you say fair housing, like, you know, one of one of the beautiful things about real estate in this country is when we compete, we compete on service, price, and business model. We're not competing on, oh, if you want access to the, these properties, you have to work with only this company, right? That's where it gets. And again, we offer EXP exclusives as an option in our tech stack. That, by the way, is fully compliant with CCP. But if you've ever heard me teach it and talk about it, there are exceptions to every rule, right? There, like the celebrity one to me is the weakest one, but like the very legitimate ones, law enforcement, right? Like there are people in this country that do really amazing things that just don't want their information out, out, out on the public. There is tenant occupied properties where you can't actually stick it in the MLS and follow the MLS rules of availability and what active is, is, is right. Like they'll say, Hey, we'll sell it for X. It's rented on a 12 month lease. You can't even see it. You got to buy it off these pictures. And then once we're under contract, we'll allow you to do an inspection. There are those type of sellers, but Ricky, statistically, that's like 1% of the market. Well, 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 okay. Let's take the, the cop, for example. Okay. They want to be protected, you know, whatever the case may be. So, so, so you take the listing. Okay. And then, and then without the CCP, 
right? Let's just say X brokerage, right? Now has their own platform. And now instead of just being able to take that listing that's on MLS and, 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 and advertise it within the office, now they can take it and put it on their public facing platform. Now it's in the public, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it was on MLS. You want to protect the privacy, but you're trying to fight this rule no, that's literally going to publicize the list. Right? Yeah, because the law enforcement argument is not searchable on Google, right? They don't want it to be publicly available for folks. But again, it would be through the portal of the company though. Correct. If it's a public facing again, uh, under the scenario of what the other camp wants, you are correct, Ricky. And again, I'm I'm completely against that. I've come out very forcibly. And I'm just saying it's the not. same thing, right? It's like it's on MLS on the public. Okay, you want to take that away so that you can publicly advertise it on your platform. What's in the public? Either way it goes. I'm trying to I'm trying to understand, Leo, if you can help me, what their I, argument I actually one, is. I haven't heard one logical sensical argument to get rid of it other than seller choice. And what I wrote in my op-ed is I hate, hate, a reminder. I like, this is not like I didn't just come in here from Goldman Sachs. I actually sold real estate. I sat across the street, across the table from thousands of sellers. Not once Ricky did a seller go, Hey, I want to list my house, but absolutely. I don't want you to put in the MLS. That's, that's my prerogative, right? They say, I want to sell my home in the shortest amount of time for the most amount of money with the least amount of hassle, right? That is what sellers want, right? There are the 1% of the exception, like, hey, I want to sell it tenant occupied, but by the way, you can't show it. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I, I, I can't actually put it in the MLS because that's against the rules. Like you have to have reasonable access to a property to list it. Hey, I have this new construction property. It's not going to be ready for 18 months. I want you to stick it in the MLS. But like, it's not safe. I don't want people showing up at the job site because they could fall into a hole, right? There are examples that are legitimately don't follow the MLS protocol. And we should have an exception to market those properties within a, a rule set that we can all agree on. But that's, that's, to me, the very small exception versus the totality of what we do every day. Right. So <clears throat> I've heard... Um some of the people that talk about this like there should be maybe maybe add like a timeline like you can advertise it you know publicly for 30 days or something without putting an mls or something for certain scenarios or whatever it just kind of for me i just i can't wrap my head around it so so which brings me to the next point i feel like the the 40-year model that was just disrupted by the new settlement changes i feel like that was a catch-22 situation where the model we had was best for consumers. However, there's a technicality that it actually did break some antitrust laws on some level. And, and, the, and the lawyers were able to, to realize this and take advantage of the situation. I'm kind of starting to get that feeling about CCP. That like, it's, it's, I can't wrap my head around it not being best for consumers. However, saying that you have, you have to put it in there with, even if the seller doesn't want to, could get into some legal things and that's why i think park city uh board of realtors just said they weren't even gonna you know their agents didn't even have to abide by the the rule until nar decided exactly what they were going to do about it um which is which i find very interesting um and i don't know anybody that's ever been fined for not putting their you know listing within mls within you know one business day but are we getting into this like technicality world where yeah, it's best for consumers, but eh, you know, it, it, you can't force everybody to do this. So we're going to do away with it and make this whole industry take it back 30, 40 years and we'll be like it is in France, be like it is in <laughs> South Africa. It's just crazy to me. Yeah, well, I, look, the, I think the, this this moment calls for leadership and folks with a voice need to educate the, the parties, whether that is the government or plaintiff's attorneys or, or whomever these parties are as to the benefits and and and, and potentially the the lack of, of of benefits that we would lose if if things change. Again, I I, I uh, I'm I'm an eternal optimist. I'm not a fatalist. I, I I think what we do as a profession is super noble and is very necessary. Right? If you look at the average net worth of a homeowner versus a tenant, um, there's so many, you know, so many examples of you know there a lot of first time homeowners would never get into a property without the guidance of 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 a very well intentioned 
real estate professional that that literally does this because they like people, right? Statistically, most of us are high eyes and they like human beings and they educate them with down payment assistance programs and all the other unique products. M m most consumers think you need to put 20% down, right? They're, they're not aware that there's FHA loans and low down payment products that are specifically designed for first time home buyers. So my, my, my stance is I will continue being loud. I will uh, advocate for consumers and agents alike, uh, because I think agents do a noble thing to protect consumers. And so I, I'm, I'm not okay with just being resigned, Ricky, to, you know, the, the, there's going to be like, look, we, if there's changes, there's changes. And, and I truly believe life is 90% what happens and, or, or, 10% what happens and 90% how you react to it. So 100%, um, 100%. Until, until I have new rule sets, I will uh, vocally, uh, uh, you know, share what I think we should do, what's best for the consumer. And again, I start there and end there, right? Like, Perfect. Fly me over, fly me over to Brazil and drop me off on a parachute with a cell phone and watch me get to work. Fly me over to South Africa or France or any of these countries, man. I've even, I've even thought about exactly how I would dominate those markets with their rule set, with no tax, uh, tax information, tax data and comps and MLS. And like, none of that really matters to, to me. I'm just thinking, man, we got one of the well, best. No, and, and, and by the way, we, we have agents that crush it in all those markets, right? With all the inefficiencies, we do. right? We do. Um, we but, do. but the reality is like, is it better here? And I, I unequivocally say yes, right? And, and even the argument of cost of sale, right? In these other countries, we get charged astronomical fees by the portals. They basically, it's it's a monopoly on how, because they're like, oh, you want to advertise? It's it's 50 pounds or euros or whatever the currency we're in per month that's active and you owe me this and if you like and, and oh by the way next year the rates are going up 30 percent, and you don't have a say in it right yeah one of the benefits of the mls ecosystem where we data share and give each other idx's to be able to you could have ricky and i can have leoprea.com and we have the same data is that it keeps the cost of marketing the home lower, which by the way, anytime there's an increase in cost, you know, it gets passed along to the end user, right? Because capitalism states, if, if, if cost is more than revenue, then you got a business. So in order to cover uh, cost increase, you increase the cost of the service or product. Yeah. 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 I just, I just hope we don't go too far in reverse is all, is all I'm hoping for. Yeah, um, no, again, I, I've been quite loud that I'm in the same camp. I want to, I like, there are things that make us unique in the world as North American real estate. And I will very vocally advocate for them. Yeah. Going back to your selling days, how long did you sell for? I sold for 16 years. Um, I started when I was 19 years old. Uh, I did close to 4,000 transactions the last 68 years of my career. I was doing four to 600 transactions a year as a mega team at Keller Williams. Mm -hmm. And how many agents did you have at that de time? De depended on the market, depended on the season. Uh, we peaked at about 30 agents, and but but I got it dialed into about 10 agents where, where I was doing four or 500 transactions a year um, when I kind of figured out my sweet spot and depending on the market cycle and the niche we were focused on. And what market was that? Um, so I, I worked the DC, Maryland, Virginia market. Um, okay. You know, I went from a solo producer in 2002 through about 2007. The market collapsed. Um, I ate a lot of humble pie. I reinvented myself during the financial crisis doing short sales in REO. Um, I did that very successfully. It scaled that uh, quite large. And then eventually I saw REO drying up uh, for folks that, don't know what that is. It's foreclosures. So it's it's the REO is the ledger in, entry at a bank for a foreclosure. Um, I pivoted to working with funds, developers, institutional. So I, I I found a very interesting niche in B2B business, right? I, I speak a very specific way. I, I, I'm good at math. So I, I, I did not spend like the latter part of my career kind of competing on listing appointments. Traditionally, it was more I would get 5, 10, 20, 50 listings at a time from some form of business, whether it was a developer, a builder, a hedge fund, a bank, um, an investor, some, some form of, of repeat, uh, reoccurring business, if you will. So 
like thinking back to to all that and fast forward in today's market and you know you've obviously gotten out of sales and gone on to do better bigger and better things selling a software company remind and uh ceo of vxp now like do you advocate for people to build teams or what do you think the best yeah. model is that's right a now? great question i'm glad you asked me that um so so I, i'm quite opinionated on teams i think there is a large portion of teams out there that are gang affiliations right they're they're not actual teams it's more like they either want to be around people or they just are kind of growing for ego um i think teams should be an evolution of excess lead generation so you know if i were coaching someone i would say every day what are you spending your time on that's dollar productive activity you can choose your own adventure whether it's prospecting whether it's referral based database building whether it's lead gen buying leads off internet i'm not a, i don't actually care what flavor of ice cream you pick but as a solo mm -hmm. producer you have you know 10 12 hours a day in the beginning you need to do all of it you wear every single hat so for me it's you know how many hours of intentional prospecting business lead generation you're doing should be at least two or three hours and then the rest of the day you have to go on appointments and showings and everything else because you're doing everything when you run yeah. out of time, you should start outsourcing the cheapest, lowest dollar productive activity that does not lead gen. And to me, it's a VA overseas for a low fee or a, a, a transaction coordinator for a transactional fee. And you keep upgrading your hours per day on what you spend time on. And eventually you're going to get to the point where literally you've outsourced everything and all you're doing is prospecting. Um, at that point, after you've brought on admin staff, you then bring on a buyer's agent, right? The first thing you you give up is the buyer's agent because raised data said 87 hours. Listing data is like 30 hours, right? It's statistically less time. So if I can work with only sellers, I'm going to get more of my hours back, right? And so I think team building should be a function of excess lead gen, right? When you, when you find out that Ricky Carruth ran out of hours in a day and you've outsourced everything you can outsource. And I no longer have the time to go show one more buyer because I'd rather go on that listing appointment. That's when you start building um, teams. And eventually, you know, you do that efficiently enough, you can get to the point where you're not in production and, and then you're a business owner and, and a rainmaker. But I think the rainmaker part never goes away, right? Whether, whether the rainmaking means that you have relationships with these portals or, or builders or developers, like, your job as the person who owns the team is to make it rain. You are the rainmaker of the team. And that's, yeah. that's, I'm quite opinionated on the subject. I know some mm -hmm. folks that kill it doing 60, 70, 80 transactions a year with no agents on their team. So mm -hmm. yes, they have team members that are admins. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe they use uh, um, businesses like Schwami for showings. And so like right. they, they retain all the agent functionality, but I know people making, you know, four or five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year with virtual team members and no like big uh, physical footprint of people. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the game of capitalism is, is especially in small to mid-sized business is building a lifestyle business that provides for the lifestyle that you're looking for. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think one is right over the other one. Mm -hmm. It's, what is your goal? How much time can you spend with the people you love? Because that's the finite part that I obsess with. It's like, hey, my 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 seven and nine year old are only going to be this little once, and they're mm -hmm. only think I'm this cool once. And if you mm -hmm. miss that, what's the point of all of it, right? To me, it's how do you optimize your lifestyle for your family goals? And, 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 you know, maybe you don't have a family, and it's just for you. But like, do you really want to be working twelve hours a day? Like, what's the goal? Is it to work zero hours? Probably not. Is it to work a hundred hours a week? Probably not. Yeah. Like there is a, a part of self-actualization as a human being that we get from work. And it's like super important that we feel stimulated and, and uh, self-actualized. And I think that's, that's the game of entrepreneurship. That's like, what do I want to make? And how many hours a week do I want to spend? And, and am I enjoying what I do? Right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're prospecting six hours a day, you know that even you would burn out, right? Like you could probably do it for like one or two, maybe three hours a day, right? Yeah. The rest of it, you have to do other things. Cause if you were on the phone for eight hours, you would probably your battery would get too drained. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you don't really advocate one way or the other. You just feel like it just depends on who you are and what you what you feel like is best for you. And 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 I advocated from a couple of different ways. Like you you like I'm uh, obsessed with having a deep understanding how you're wired, right? Like I just did a master class on the disc that we put out okay. to our network. Um, like you and I are built different in different ways, right? Like you're a masterful prospector and you have like the ability to uh, handle rejection better than most people I've met. And I'm saying it as the deepest compliment that I mean it with, right? Um, I can't do that. Like to me, that's like playing in traffic for my brain and how I'm wired. Mm. Unlike most people, I can get in a, in front of a stage of five, 6,000 people and have nothing prepared mm. and freestyle for 45 minutes. Yeah. Like statistically speaking, that's actually scarier than death for a large percentage of human yeah. beings. Yeah. yeah. Statistically speaking. Right. Um, so my ability to do that would work really well when I went and tried to go get these institutional accounts and I had to fly there and I had to build rapport with a bunch of people that I didn't know and all that kind of stuff. So again, I think if you figure out where your genius zone, where your happy zone is, whatever word that like you identify with. Because mm-hmm. this, this is what I truly believe. If if I actually get to live live and work in my gifts, like this is what I like to do, right? Like interacting with people and sharing and pouring into people. Like I'm going to get off this phone call excited. Mm. I'm going to have high energy and I'm going to go pick up my son from school and we're going to go to his jujitsu class and I'm going to make dinner and I'm going to be in the best mood possible. Yesterday at the end of the day, I did three hours of finance calls because we're getting ready to close the quarter. Mm. And I was just like, Right. <laughs> it was right. just like, look, like I, I told the kids, I was like, Hey guys, I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to lie down. Right. Like talk to your mom. I don't, I don't want to talk to you or your mom right now. Right. Yeah. Because like, and not because, because I know I'm not going to show up the way I want to show up. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so my, my, my thought process is if I end every day like that, look, I, I have the, the, the privilege of only ending one or two days a quarter like that because it's non-negotiable in my role i have to get ready and like i'd have to go through these numbers but there are people that go through life whether it's an entrepreneurship or a job where they're drained at the end of the day and they they think it's maybe i'm in a bad mood or work suck it's like no you're doing something that drains your energy in not a good way right so i i think life is figuring out doing something that you love being around people that you like and at the end of the day i think you you end up um you end up a happier human being that way. Do you have a hard stop? I, I do. I, I have another call. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Well, um, yeah, we, we could keep going. Like I got like five or 10 more questions here that just come to mind as you're, as you're talking there about stuff, but, um, I appreciate your time today, man. And we'll, we'll do it again very soon and I'll see you next week. Absolutely. sir. Yeah, no, I, no, let's do it again. I, I, I like, this is the stuff I enjoy doing and pouring into our people. I, I, I looked at the podcast stuff. today. It's like Leo Pereira, you know, like, and pulled up and was just like, boom, 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 boom. Like you've been on like 15 podcasts in the past couple months. So yeah. Yeah. You're making your rounds. Well, good awesome, stuff, man. I, I'm proud of you. Um, thank you for your service and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Sounds good. Take care, bro. Hey, bro. Bye.